Hey everybody, let's see if we can learn Python in 15 minutes. If you find this video helpful, be sure to stay tuned for the series that I'm going to put out going much more in depth on each topic we talk about and more coming soon. Try to code along, but remember, we're going to be going fast. So the first thing we have to do is download Python 3 on our machine if you don't have it already. So go on Google, type in Python 3, click download, and you can check if it's installed properly on your machine by typing in Python 3 dash capital V. And if it returns the Python 3 version you have, have, you're all set to go. So we're going to pull up the Python shell, which is basically a built-in program in Python that allows us to code in Python and see the result right away. All we have to do is type Python 3. It'll bring up the Python shell, which allows us to type in code and it interprets it right away because Python reads code line by line. It's an interpreted language. And just in case you wanted to know, if you wanted to quit out of Python 3, type in quit parentheses and you're out. Don't want any of you thinking you're stuck in this forever. Let's go ahead and type in our first program in Python, which will be hello world. We can accomplish this by using the print function. It will probably be very helpful when you try debugging stuff in the future. And we can go ahead and put in a string. We can use single quotes or double quotes. And a string is just like a word. We're going to talk more about types in a second. If we just press enter, it then prints hello. Comments in Python, you can use hashtags. So if I were to use the same thing and then throw a hashtag in front of it, it would ignore everything after the hashtag. So we can use comments for a ton of different things, keep track of stuff in our code and make notes to ourselves for later. We can also do multi-line comments by doing three double quotes. Recognize that when we press enter, it took us to the next line, write anything inside of here, finish the triple double quotes, we're going to start this out with types because types are very important to understand the rest of the language. We just looked at a type from before. We can go ahead and save it as a variable. And to do that, since Python is dynamically typed, we do not have to actually specify the type in the declaration part. This part, we just have to state the variable's name and then we can go ahead and write hello. We just saved the string literal hello to the variable a. So now if we just typed a, it would be hello. And this is a string type. Since Python is dynamically typed, even though this current variable is storing a string, we can go ahead and save it as a different type. So another type in Python is integers, and we can type an integer any whole number. So if we type a, it now contains four, and this is an integer, the int object. Something you probably will run into a lot when you're programming is converting from an integer to a string. If we have a equals four, and we wanted this to now be an integer so we can add it to something, what we would have to do is cast it. So we would have to say a equals int a. And what this does is it allows us to turn it into an integer because we're using the int method. What we now have is a saved as four without the single quotes. So that's very important. And other thing to note is that strings are immutable. If a currently equals hello and we wanted to convert it to uppercase, we can do a dot upper, but notice it's returning hello. If we type A again, it didn't actually do anything to A because strings are immutable. We would have to then save the variable A to A dot upper. And now A is capitalized. Okay, let's move on to other types. The next type we can look at is a float, any kind of decimal number that could be like 3.5. That's the float class in Python. Another thing that you're going to use a lot in Python are booleans, and that's true or false values, right? So you use that a lot for conditional control flow statements when we get up to it. That could be A equals true, and remember to capitalize the first letter in true or false. That A is true, and that is a bool. There is also the none type. So if you want to save the value as something currently to nothing, you would just say it's none. So that's none. So one of the most interesting types we just mentioned was a string type. One thing you may be asking yourself is what happens when you add two strings together? So let's go ahead and save a as two. If we were to add a plus a string of one, it gives us 21, which obviously doesn't make sense on a math standpoint, but what it basically did was concatenate the two together. However, if we were to add in the string plus the actual integer one, we would actually get a type error. So that's something to keep in mind. And that's why it's very important to remember when you have to cast something. So there you go. We casted the integer to a string and then we were able to add them together. If you don't feel like doing that, we're able to add this F in front of the string. So we can say A is equal to F and then inside the quotes, we can go ahead and just put in A. So when we put brackets inside an F string, it's going to interpolate that as Python code. What this should do is make A equal to two one. The reason why we're able to do that was providing this F outside of the quotes. Let's look into conditions. Let's go ahead and save A to one. So now A is an integer of one. And if we were to go through a condition, if a is greater than zero, and in Python, you have to give indents. So I'm going to press tab. And now we're indented. 
and then I'm going to say print. Based on the logic, this should be greater than zero. Once I press enter, we get greater than zero. As you can see, if I did not provide the indentation over here, indentation error because it did not provide a new block of code. A little annoying, but it helps parse the code. If it's less than zero, as you can see, it did not print false inside this print statement to false statement. And because it did not meet that condition, it did not print anything. Now we could also throw this on one line, but if we are going to make a separate block of code, we have to go ahead and add indentations. So something a little bit different in Python is it has the elif expression, which just stands for else if. If we have a equals negative one, and we were to say if a is greater than zero, what if we wanted to add another condition for if it's less than zero? If we don't press enter again, we can go ahead and say elif a is less than zero. And what that should do after we press enter again is print less. We can also just do an else statement, which would be else with the colon, it picks up the else. That's conditionals in Python. Now there's actually no need to use these parentheses in the condition. I just use them out of habit. Let's create an error over here. Now if we just wrote out a is greater than one, as you can see, we get a type error is because we just tried comparing a string to integer one. So another thing we can look into now is functions in Python. And the way we define functions in Python is by using the def keyword, write the name of the function. In this case, we're going to say add inside our parentheses. We'll put the parameters. Remember to hit tab and then we will write x plus y. What we got here is a function add where we can go ahead and put in two things together. Let's add one and two and it gives us three. Let's look at what we call in Python sequences. If we wanted to look at an individual character in that string, we can go ahead and look at it by just using bracket notation. So if I were to say a bracket zero, and because that's everything in Python is indexed at zero, a bracket zero is the character p. A zero plus a one concatenate the p character and the y character to a string p y. Let's go ahead and talk about other kind of sequences. One other kind of sequence is a tuple. And this is similar to a static array because it's constant in the fact that you can't change the size of it. I can save a sequence of numbers in a tuple, separate it by commas, and I could go ahead and then access it using bracket notation. Zero index of top is one. Tuples are immutable. So if I tried to go in and just change the zero index of top to five, I would not be able to. So we can find the size of the tuple, adding it into this method that we can use for most data structures in Python. If you want to work with something more of a dynamic array, use something called a list. We would initialize it with square brackets instead of parentheses. We can append other stuff. Now our list has four at the end. As you can see, it's mutable. We can add things to it. We can also sort it. Now hashes or sets in Python. It's very similar to how we made the other data structures, except this one cares about unique values. It's similar to hashes in other languages, and we would initialize our set like this, and you would use soft brackets. Let's say we added four to our set. Now we look at our set, we added four just fine. However, if we added one to our set, there actually is no extra one, and that's because set only stores unique values. It's based on a hash, so it makes sense. You can quickly look up if something's in your set. So if I'm looking for three, I would say three in in st and that would give us a boolean expression since there's three in st we get true one of the last main data structures in python that we will look at is a dictionary it's similar to a set however it's a key value pair i would use the soft brackets i would add the key in this case we're going to add one since i called key one it gave me the actual value of it that's very useful it's similar to maps in other programming languages so now that we know some data structures we can go ahead and iterate through them. We would do that using a for loop for i in provide the data structure. I will provide the dictionary we just had. Hit tab again because we're in the block of code. Print i. Let's check it out. By going through the dictionary, we were able to print out the actual keys. So the next question, how do we go ahead and get the values from this dictionary? Well, we could do the for loop again, but instead of just doing dictionary, we can use items. What dot items did is it actually gives us the key value pairs, what looks like as tuples because it's using parentheses. Iterating through other data structures are very similar. So you don't just need a data structure or a sequence to iterate through a loop. You can actually go ahead 
ahead and iterate through a loop for i in range. And what the range does is it gives you a range from what number you give. So indexed at zero. So it goes through that range of 10 and prints out zero through nine. Now, as you may know already, the I is arbitrary. So I could have a list of colors, go ahead and then iterate. This is just any variable. So I could type color that's creating a variable for each thing it iterates. We're just choosing any name we can think of and we have to just remember to use that name. So those are the main data structures in Python. I definitely recommend practicing with them and you can easily practice with them by solving Solving some algorithms. You probably will not remember every single function or method related to each data structure. But if you have the Python documentation next to you, as you go ahead and try to solve these, you'll easily start picking them up. Let's start creating our own data structures by introducing classes. And classes are a way of creating objects. Now, everything in Python is an object. Let's type in class and then the name. Let's say we want to make a dog class and that would be the syntax to create it. We would write this special function two underscores and then in it and then another two underscores parentheses to accept all the parameters for this class first write self because that's accepting the object and then we would write name because a dog always has a name so this is called a constructor in python and we use it to actually initialize our class or object two tabs and then we would say self dot name so now we are creating a property for name inside this object that equals the name that we provide over here and now we got our own class we can create an object called the dog and just as it looks here we would provide the arguments for our dog class we do not have to provide self that's automatically provided we just have to provide the name type dog this is bringing up the dog object from the memory in the computer if i were to go ahead and type dog.name it gives us the dog's name is Leo. And this is great for storing information for creating our own data structures and allowing us to write more developed code. So that's a little sneak peek at object oriented programming in Python. So let's go one step further. Let's look at inheritance and inheritance. All it is, it's taking an object we already created. It's extending that object to a new class so it can inherit all the features. And then you can build on top of that as well. So it's great for creating templates for other objects and allowing ourselves to write less code. We're going to now inherit from this dog class and actually create a breed of dog. So let's go ahead and create a doodle class. So the way we would do this is we would make a class doodle. It will actually take in an argument, which will be the dog class. And then we create the constructor and it will take in self as an argument. It will also have to take in name as an argument because of the dog class. And then we want to know if it's curly because sometimes it can be curly and sometimes they're not curly. To fully inherit from it, we just have to remember to use the super method, which basically takes the entire class that we're inheriting from and provides a constructor there. We have to remember to fill that constructor as well. So we'll have to add the name. And other thing we can do is we can throw in an attribute for it being curly. So now we're creating the curly property for the doodle class. We're going to say, equals curly. We have created a doodle class that now inherits from the dog class and it also has an extra attribute whether it's curly or not. So when we create the doodle named Leo, it will also require an other argument. So we're going to add true because the dog is curly. It creates a new doodle object. We can also see the doodle's name because it inherits from the dog class. We can also see if the doodle is curly. So that's a little sneak peek of inheriting. There's a lot of stuff you can do with objects. Other things we might care about is error handling. Remember back when we had a variable that was a string and we tried comparing it to an integer, we get an error. How can we make this a little cleaner? How can we handle this error without having the program just crash? So we can use something that's common in many languages, which is the try keyword. It's going to say, okay, let's try this. And we're going to press enter. If we do find an error in it, we can make it an exception. If it's a type error, we can just print to the screen. We ran through this, but we didn't get that ugly error because we use a try to handle it cleanly, gracefully, and just say A is not a number. So another important thing about Python is using other libraries. These libraries are called modules. So there's a lot of libraries built into Python, but in order to use them, you have to import them. So you would do that like import the math module. You get the math module and all the functions and properties that comes with the math module. So if we wanted to use stuff that was in the math library, say 
square root, we could go ahead and use the square root. So the square root of nine, we get three. And that's using the math library. Also as properties, we can use math.pi, it gives us pi. Making use of modules makes it a lot easier on you because you can use these other libraries that are already created for you just by importing it into your code. So that's Python in 15 minutes. Hope you guys found this video helpful. If you did, be sure to hit a like button. And if you have not already, be sure to subscribe to this channel. Stay tuned for the Python series I will be putting out out on a weekly or bi-weekly basis very soon. It'll be covering each of these topics that we went over and more in more depth. So hopefully you guys will get a lot out of that. And our goal is to end up building a full stack application that'll be a lot later on, but we will get there. So hope you guys enjoy it.